Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is writer inker Carl Kiesel. Carl, welcome to Comic Culture. Well, thank you, Terrence. Great to be here. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Section Zero. This is the, uh, the most recent edition uh, as part of a Kickstarter campaign. I, I know that you've been working on this project for a number of years, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what Section Zero is. Well, uh, Section Zero is uh the you know the boilerplate is 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 it's a uh, secret section of the United Nations Charter which perpetually funds a team of experts and explorers to investigate the strange and unknown. Um, it's basically Jack Kirby does the X Files. So we have all of the creatures, all of the monsters, and a lot more hitting and explosions. Tom and I we started it back in two thousand for uh, Image Comics. It was part of the Guerrilla Comics imprint that was coming out from Image at the time, and um, unfortunately. Uh, Due to personal circumstances, I, was, I, I got divorced. I could no longer continue working on it, and so we suspended it. But uh, virtually from the day we suspended it, we tried to find a way to bring it back. The problem was finding a way to pay our bills while we still worked on it. And um, there were places like IDW, and even Image was interested in continuing it at the time, but they couldn't pay us any money, and I couldn't work for free. And it wasn't until... Kickstarter came along that we found a way to, to do both. I mean, you know, we're paying ourselves a very low wage, but we can get by. And so we can work on something we love and, and it makes all the difference, believe me. I guess by the time this airs, it'll have already launched, but um, you're starting a, another Kickstarter campaign. And one of the things you said is that, you know, even though you might have a publisher lined up who would be putting the books out, it doesn't cover your actual expenses. And I think a lot of people don't understand that, um, you know, your time and, and efforts take a lot of time and effort. Uh, so how does Kickstarter allow you as, a, as an artist, as a writer to, um, you know, keep going? Well, I mean, you can set your, your, funding, your, your funding goal. And for uh, both the last Kickstarter and the one we're running right now for Section Zero 1959, we're, we're looking for $60,000. Now, about 10,000, maybe 15,000 of that goes towards Kickstarter fees and printing costs. And the rest of it goes into Tom and my and our colorist and our letterers pockets so that we can, you know, pay each other and uh, survive. You know, um, I, you know, I, I have to say the, the example of, you know, federal workers having to go to work without getting a check. That's what it's like working on a creator owned book. A lot of times you're working and you're not getting paid. There are, there are, a few books that Image will pay up money front for, um, and even Dark Horse or uh, um, IDW will pay you some money up front, but it's not enough to live on, not when you've got a family and a house. And so Kickstarter, knock on wood, you know, once before they uh, they gave us enough money to scrape by, and we're, we're hoping to get enough money to scrape by again, because this is really what we love to do. You know, as someone who read your comics in the 90s, and going back, I guess, to the 80s when you were on uh, Legion of Superheroes. Um, it's just one of those those things where uh, it seems a lot of creators at some point get out of comics because whatever economic reason there might be. But it's it's interesting to see that you're able to use crowdfunding to connect to your fans, and um, you know they can help you get a book out that they want to read rather than you know hoping that DC or Marvel might have some project that comes up. With our new one, Section Zero Fifty Nine, it's. It's our tribute to the challenges of the unknown, and they fight big Kirby monsters that you would have seen in the old Tales to Astonish or uh, Strange Tales books. And quite honestly, this is a book I've wanted to do for decades. I, I have proposal art that I sent to Tom Brevoort at Marvel uh, back in the late 80s that he still has. He still has it because we've you know, exchanged emails. And the, the major companies are not interested in that sort of book. And uh, I really am interested in that sort of book. So we're going we're gonna to do it, hopefully. We're right now about 50% funded in two days. So uh, hopefully we can raise the other 30,000 in the next 28 days. And I was one of the, uh, I guess, the lucky folks who helped um, get this book into my hands. Uh, and I'm just wondering, when you start a Kickstarter campaign, how many people are you reaching? And uh, not that I want to talk you know, dollar amounts, but, but how does right. that help you, uh, I guess, social media? Because I know you're doing a lot of work. Uh, on top of the artwork to tell us how the process is going. So I'm wondering, you know, how many people are you reaching out to and, and how much time is that taking from, you know, sitting down at the drawing board or at the computer to put together the script? It takes a huge amount of time, much more than I expected the first time around. And, you know, quite honestly, part of our budget this time around is, is an administrative fee for me because running the Kickstarter campaign, dealing with the printers, 
uh, running, you know, I'm doing the marketing job, I'm doing the editorial job, and I don't mind this, quite honestly. I love all of it, but it does take up time. It's interesting, too, because you're using this, you're reaching out to the fans, uh, you know, and a lot of people always, you know, they, they just assume that uh, it's easy. You know, it, there's, you're doing things for exposure and, and uh, you know, that there should be, uh, you know, you should just do it for the love of doing it. But you, you talk about putting an administrative fee in, and that makes perfect sense because as someone who's done video productions where you, you know, you're spending countless hours before you even, you know, take the camera out of the bag, getting everything ready, you know, you still need to, to eat and pay the rent during that time. So I guess that's, that's sort of the same thing. And, and you're reaching out to a large number of people. Do you have like a, just a general email list or, or how does Kickstarter give you the information so that you can keep in touch? Well, I mean, quite honestly, the first time around, I was very, very naive. And um, I, I worked social media to a certain degree, but I think I was just lucky, quite honestly. I mean, uh, with the first campaign, I was convinced we were not going to fund. We hadn't reached 50% at the halfway mark. And I thought, there's no way we're going to raise more than 50% in the last half. But on the last day, we raised over $15,000. We raised over a quarter, about a quarter of our goal on the last day. And so there was something made the uh, the social media beast wake up, and I don't even know what that is. Um, but uh, uh, you know, after that, of course, then I had a thousand people who had backed the book, and I had their names, and I had their emails, and I could keep in touch with them. And uh, you know, I mean, a lot of those people have already you know come back to uh, you know the Section Zero Fifty Nine campaign, and um, and and then I try to reach out and and uh, through podcasts and through print uh, print or web media interviews and stuff like that. Other people who are doing creator-owned books, um, you know, a lot of times they will, you know, mention my book if in turn I mention their book. And um, I have no, nothing against that as long as I honestly believe in the other book, you know. So, I mean, really, it's, it's a lot of networking and uh, picking up one person here and four people there. And, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to need a thousand people this time. And you're working with, uh, I'm not sure, is Tom Grummet? Is that the pronunciation? Yeah, it's Tom Grummet, yeah. Um, yeah so I, sometimes joke, is, I sometimes joke you should say his name Grummet, but that's just to confound people. <laughs> the two of you have been working together for uh, a number of years, I guess going back several decades. And so I'm wondering how that collaboration works. Uh, is it something where, you know, you're the Stan and you just say, uh, you know, the Fantastic Four fights God and go? Or is it something where the two of you are kind of going through plot points and, and you know, a full script and all that other stuff. Yeah, we work, uh, um, I think, much more collaboratively, not to the point of, of, you know, me just saying something like, you know, you know, the North Carolina green swamp, go, you know, but, um, but uh, you know, I come up with a basic idea and um, I, I usually know the beats to a story, to an issue, to a chapter, and I'll give Tom usually a phone call and go, to, go over it with him and he'll go, well, this doesn't make sense. And he's right. And how about if they do that? And it sounds like a better idea. And um, or he'll say some, you know, something and I'll go, yeah, but see, later on, I want to do this, you know, and we, we start fitting the pieces together. And from there, um, I can sit down and write a, a plot that I then send him and he works on. And uh, then I will dialogue over uh, his finished pencils when I get them, even on section zero. I will admit the uh, when we finished off the first book, uh, the second half, there's just an awful lot of pieces we had to fit together. So I did write a full script for that. But uh, with Section 059, we're back to doing plot dialogue. And I think it's very appropriate to the kind of stories we're doing there, too. And, and what makes that collaboration work? I mean, 20 years to working on a project together, or different projects together, uh, what is it that makes the two of you want to keep working together that the ideas flow and, and that you know, the, the proof is on the page? Well, I think um, we're, we're very simpatico. I mean, we, we have very, you know, we were both born in the same year. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but we were both born in 59. And uh, we view comics uh, very similarly. We like very similar different, very similar kinds of comics. We both, you know, love those old Marvel monster comics. We love the, you know, the slam bang action of a cha of a Challengers of the Unknown by Kirby or something like that. I seem to write the sort of stories Tom likes to draw, and Tom certainly draws them the way I like to have them drawn. I never have complaints about his stuff. His stuff is so uh, dynamic and so crystal clear, and he brings wonderful little nuance to the characters that sometimes I hadn't thought of, you know. Um, I, I really do think um, we're just, you know, I don't know, we fit, we fit really well. That's all there is to it.
Mike Nesmith wrote in his, his book, Infinite Tuesdays, that there's, there's a moment he refers to as people becoming the band. And it's you know, that moment when mm -hmm. you're collaborating with somebody and everything just kind of works for that particular period of time. And that's, that to me is endlessly fascinating because um, the fact that you're able to come up with new ideas and, and new approaches. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about, uh, you keep mentioning Jack Kirby, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, this is something that I find interesting too, is what sort of comics were you reading when you were younger? I mean, obviously there's going to be some Kirby in there, but, but what were the, the books that you looked for in the store and, and that really captured your attention? Well, Jack Kirby comics. I mean, I mean my first favorite comic was, um, was The X-Men by Neil Adams and Roy Thomas. I remember deciding very definitely, this is my favorite comic. And, um, of course... I decided that, and like two months later, they canceled the title. So, so, and uh, and then then I decided my favorite title was Daredevil, and they went to bi monthly, and and I started thinking that I I was like this curse. I actually thought as a child that I had this like black touch, you know. But um, you know, I I, I don't know. I I I've, I've always been attracted, I think, to uh, second tier characters or something about the underdog that really appeals to me. And so I, but I was, a, I, I really like in the, uh, in the late sixties when DC was coming out with the craziest ideas and they would all last like seven issues, you know, like Batlash and Hawk and Dove and Creeper and Anthro. And I loved all of those. And, you know, they, they make this bright flash and then they go away, you know? Um, so, you know, th those are all big influences on me. Um, uh, the fantastic four was a huge influence on me. The, the Kirby, uh, the Jack Kirby and Stan Lee run. I came in around issue 80, so I got about you know 20 good issues of them. And I still think you know uh, the Skrull takes a slave where Ben is kidnapped and becomes a, a gladiator in a, in a world that's run by like these alien gangsters. I love that story. I think that's just wonderful. I didn't know at the time that clearly Kirby was cribbing from Star Trek, you know, because there's a Star Trek episode that's all about a gangster planet. Jack must have watched that and go, yeah, I can do that. That'll be fun. Um, but you know. Those, you know, so that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but those are kind of some of the things in my, in my head, in my mix. And you mentioned those second tier characters. I always find that those are the books that the, the, uh, the folks uh, higher up don't really mind the creators taking a risk. And that's where you start to see, you know, Frank Miller turning Daredevil into something special. Uh, or even right. Claremont and, uh, and Cockrum turning uh, the X-Men when it comes back into something. I know. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the world of inking. Now, um, a lot of people might not know what an inker does. I'm wondering, what's your definition of an inker, and how do you approach, when you see you know, those pencils on a page, how do you uh, balance between your, imp uh, your imprint and, and what the artist, uh, the pencil artist, has done? Uh, inking is, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, classically, pencils are not reproducible. They're, they're, the line is too soft and indistinct. So the line has to be gone over in ink, which is a very definite black and makes the page very definitely black and white, and that can become easily reproducible. I mean, obviously, technology's moved kind of beyond that, but this is the way it's classically done. And um, so as an inker, that's what I do. I get penciled pages. I take out my brush. I have my brush right here. Take out my brush dip in my ink and, you know, I start going over the pencils to make them uh, reproducible. And part of the inker's job is to help define the depth of the panel. So figures in the foreground will have probably a, a thicker outline than figures in the background to help them fall into the background. A lot of times I'll, uh, I'll enhance texture. Uh, I think texture is a big part of the inking job, although in nowadays world, color hands, handles a lot of that too. And as far as my own personal uh, approach, um, the first rule of inking, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is it's the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. So when I get a page of pencils, I want to make sure I hand it in at least as good as I got it, at least as good. It can't, it can't be worse. And if, if there's some small ways uh, I can make it better by maybe adding blacks um, or that sort of thing, uh, depending on my relationship with the penciler, I will do that. Um, a lot of times I have found over the years, and this is like really zen, but I have to not just look at what's on the paper, but I actually have to try to think, what was the penciler trying to draw here? It, you know, if he's, you know, and this, I guess, touches on texture, what I'm about to say is, you know, if he's trying to draw water, okay, that needs a really soft, organic line. And even if his line isn't soft and organic, I, you know, he wants water. I should give it a soft, organic line. And if it's brick, it should have a harder edge. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
so sometimes it isn't just tracing what's on the paper. It's really trying to to figure out what the penciler was trying to draw and translate that into ink. You're trying, in many ways, trying to get into his head or her head. And you're talking about texture, and this is something uh, that's, you know, you're talking about trying to create depth on a, a flat, two-dimensional piece of paper and make it seem like it's a real world. And uh, I'm just wondering, you, you talk about uh, an organic line, you talked about using a brush, and I'm just wondering, uh, when you're doing figures, I can understand, you know, a brush would be, you can get nice flowing uh, and, and uh, I guess, lines that go and get thicker at certain points. So how do you mm -hmm. handle uh, something like a brick wall? Is that something that you can keep using the brush with, or are you switching over to a pen? And, and how do you kind of give it that texture look? Is it just like, you know, a dot here or there? Yeah, so, I mean, it's different techniques, but I do use a pen, too. I have, I have my pen here, too, a little crow quill. I use, um, I use a 108. A lot of people use a 102, but the 108 is very flexible, which you can't see on, on the TV. But So it gives you a kind of brush-like line, so I feel it, it fits my brush lines better. It meshes better, and I will use that for textures like brick or, or something that I want a little more of a uh, technical line. I don't use uh, rapidographs or markers very much at all. Um, even, quite honestly, even if I'm doing long curves, uh, I, I'll get a French curve and hold it quite on, a, on its edge, and then I'll take my brush and go along the edge of the French curve. And, and I just think it gives even those nice, nice curved lines more of an organic feel, you know? Um, but I'll, I'll ink even cars and machines with a brush because I, I think it makes it look more like it's part of that world. Whereas if I'd gone in with, with you know, markers or rapidographs that would kind of give it a really technical look, like it was drawn on a blueprint paper or something, to, to me that separates it from the figures a little too much. I like, you know, I think, I think cars look like, um, cars especially and that sort of thing look a lot warmer and more sexy when they're drawn with a brush, quite honestly, if you ask me. Uh, well, you know, it, it takes, I guess, a great deal of confidence and control to be able to do something that is, uh, you know, using a, a brush on a, a French curve. So I'm wondering, at what point in your journey as an artist did you start to realize that you, you had that ability, that you were, where you were able to see that, you know, you had that ability to elevate the page and to, to kind of take a chance with a texture or by using a brush for a, a, a line or something? I, I guess my answer to that is um, I, I didn't realize it. And it, I was in college, and my roommate at the time, who knew quite a bit about comics, he didn't want to be a cartoonist, but he knew a lot about comics. And one day he said to me, he goes, you know, I really like your ink line. And then I thought, maybe that's my way in. Maybe I should try to be an inker, and maybe that's my easiest way in. Because I've always had a, a big problem with the blank page. I really, there's too many options. There's too many possibilities, and, and, it, and it paralyzes me. Um, and so that, you know, I'm very, very slow as a penciler because of that. And, um, so it was my, my college roommate who told me I had a good ink line and, and that's what I started focusing on. And it served me well over the years. And quite honestly, I've gotten to work with and, uh, you know, become friends with great people because of it. I mean, if I was a penciler, I, I wouldn't have worked with, uh, you know, John Byrne or George Perez or Art Adams or any number of people that, um, I've been really, uh, honored and lucky to work with. You talk about how you had the opportunity to work with these great artists. I'm wondering how you had the opportunity to start writing comics, because that seems like it's, it's a little bit of a different world, uh, you know, uh, writing the words that everyone's going to read and coming up with that idea versus working with somebody to get the page ready for printing. From the very beginning, I was always interested in being a writer also. Um, I, uh, I actually, while I was inking Tales of the Legion of Superheroes, over Terry Shoemaker, that was my first monthly gig gig at DC or anywhere. Um, and Terry only lasted six issues and he wanted to move on to something else. And I, I gave Karen Berger, the editor, a proposal for an idea that Terry and I could do together that I would write. So even six months into my inking career, I was looking for ways to find writing work. That, that obviously proposal never went anywhere. But the, but the funny thing about that, that, that was a story about um, Terry, uh, um, Terry Shoemaker loved cars. He loved cars. And so I thought, well, what could we do with cars? What, and I came up with this idea with cars. And the main character, I, I found the proposal many years later. The main character's personality was exactly like Superboy's. I was like, going, oh, my God, I've had this Superboy character in my head for so long, you know. Um, so anyway, so, so from the very beginning, I, I kept trying to make inroads into the writing world. And, um, you know, luckily, uh, my first wife at the time, she was an editor and a writer and uh, working with her, that got us the chance to work on Hawk and Dove, the first miniseries and the regular ongoing series. 
And um, I think after people started seeing what um, what I could do there, then they started trusting me a little bit here and there on my own. And, uh, you know, then that career grew and grew, luckily. When I was inking John Byrne on Superman, he said my nickname should be Carl the Kibitzer Kiesel, because I would always go, John, John, I got this idea. John, I got this idea. And, and quite honestly, he was very patient. Um, and the only idea I think he really uh, grabbed and used was I said, you know, terrible Turpin. He could be Brooklyn from the Boy Commandos all grown up. And John liked that. And he put it in. And that was very thrilling to me, you know. And I did the same thing when I was thinking Suicide Squad. I would write long letters to John Ostrander with ideas about the book because I loved that book so much. And uh, his wife, Kim, uh, Kim Yale, was, called them the Kiesel of Peasels. So um, it was... <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, so, so I've always been a bother about this sort of thing, is what I'm saying. It's funny, too, because you're mentioning the, the books that you've worked on, and these are, are not small books. So, uh, you know, you, you've worked your way from Legion of Superheroes, which at the time was uh, very popular for DC, and then you're working on the, the reboot of Superman with John Byrne, which is a huge book. Suicide Squad, I mean, That's gosh, uh, fantastic uh, series. Um, and then you're working on, on Superman and Superboy, and I'm wondering how you, you're kind of going from a love of those, those B-list characters to, you know, A-list. Yeah, you know, that is, that is odd, and um, I, I am more at home and comfortable with B-list characters. Um, you, know, I, you know, I think that was one of the reasons why um, the, the Newsboy Legion show up so much in Superboy and, uh, and Cadmus, Project Cadmus. I mean, that, that was out of the Jimmy Olsen stuff that Kirby had did, done, and Luckily, Jerry Ordway also loved that. So Jerry had seeded all of that in Adventures of Superman, then he left the book, and when I took over writing, it was so easy to pick up those pieces because my heart was already there. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I can never say that, you know, I can't say that I ever had this burning desire to work on Superman, and Superman has been, been very good to me. I'll, I'll never complain about it. But from the very beginning, when I got the job, I said, okay, I'm going to write the Superman book for people who don't, like Superman, because I was never a huge Superman fan. And um, I, I can't say I necessarily succeeded, although I will say I, I became very fond of Superman working on it. And, uh, and I still say to this day, you know, Superman has the best supporting cast in comics. I mean, Jimmy and Lois and Perry make a wonderful core of characters, and Ma and Pa, those are great supporting characters that you can create thousands of stories out of, obviously. That is actually, it's my favorite era of, of Superman, being a, a big Superman fan. Um, I see we probably have about three minutes or so uh, left in our conversation. And I'm just wondering if we could talk a little bit more about Section Zero uh, and um, just basically, you know, when you're working on this book, you, now you're talking about 1959. Uh, you had another one that was the continuation of a story that you began in the early 2000s. So I'm wondering, how many uh, iterations of Section Zero can you come up with, and, and what can we look forward to? Well, I mean, as, as long as people fund us through Kickstarter, and uh, you know, we, we'll just keep pumping these things out. And uh, it really is where our heart lies. And one of the things we love about Section Zero is it is a very flexible idea, since it's founded by the, uh, you know, as part of the United Nations Charter, it has a history. It goes back into the late 40s. And so we can set a story in any time period from then until now. And, uh, and in fact, you might see a, a cameo by some of the Section Zero members of the future in the next book. So, um, I mean, you know, the landscape is unlimited for Section Zero. It's really, you know, and, and I mean, this book came about because we were going to do more or less a, a very uh, traditional sequel to the first book. And Tom Grum is the one that said, you know, I'd really like to do something with those first four characters, those, those you know, adventurers, you know, set in, in the 50s. Wouldn't that be great fun? And, you know, he didn't have to twist my arm. I love that stuff. And, um, and quite honestly, since we were suddenly, you know, both turning 60 this year, 59, 60 years ago, it, it, those pieces seem to mesh really well. So there's, you know, I, we can do this for the rest of our lives, quite honestly. We can do this for the rest of our lives. And is this something where you have this, I mean, you're doing a lot of world building, but do you have, like, do you know how everything was put together from, uh, you know, the UN charter all the way to the present day and beyond? Or is this just something where it's like, hey, there's a thread here. Let's see what we can come up with. It's a little bit of both. I mean, I have certain ideas. Um, you, know, the, you know, one of the characters in the 59 book is named Everest Pike. I know his journey. I, I really have it in my head. And then I know one of the other characters go, but the other two characters, I have no idea what happens to them, you know. So sometimes 
and, and it's happened to me before. Sometimes these characters write themselves and they go in directions you never would have expected, expected them to go. Carl, uh, I wanted to say we, we've just about run out of time, but if somebody wanted to learn more information about Section Zero, how can they get in touch with you? How can they find out more about the book and, and look for future Kickstarter projects? Well, the easiest place to, to check out is uh, sectionzero1959.com. Uh, right now, that takes you right to the Kickstarter page. After Kickstarter is over, it'll take you to... Uh, um, our, our website, which is Panic Button Press. That's the, the name of our publishing empire is Panic Button Press. We've put out one book so far. Um, but but uh, that's the easiest way to find us uh, and find out information about Section Zero, sectionzero1959.com. And those are the numbers, 1959. So. Carl, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us today. And thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.